Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, welcome to PC Evangelical and Reformed Church. Great to see everybody, and it's an honor to begin our week with worship. And as we worship the Lord, we have some announcements to highlight. Of course, check the bulletin for the local times and listings of any announcements that may affect you the most specifically. We're having the quarterly meeting immediately following this morning's worship service. Um, also, just want to recognize that Glenn Wenzel and his family worshiping with us today, and this is the first time Glenn's been able to be here in a while. Okay. Also, we have some special birthday announcements. Tomorrow is Nancy Applin's birthday and Landon Hansen's birthday. Wednesday, Beverly Bowman and Lisa Geiger. And on May 1st, Mary Stecker. So happy birthday to everybody. <laughs> and we have a lot of anniversaries, too. Yesterday, Sandy and Jim Myers, 56th anniversary. So happy anniversary. Okay. And then um, Wilbert and Lynn Stecker, tomorrow's their anniversary. Royal and Betty Becker, Tuesday's their anniversary. And then this weekend, Dean and Renee Fisher and Debbie and Dennis Hintz celebrate their anniversary. And then Brad and Laura Keyes, 15th anniversary. Wyatt and Diane Hansen, 16th anniversary, May 1st and May 2nd. So happy anniversary. <laughs> Do we have any other announcements to highlight? Okay. Well, this concludes our morning announcements. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. And Father, thank you that we have the privilege and the pleasure and the prerogative of worshiping you. We dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing number 164, I Must Tell Jesus. When I'm going through a tough time, I can't hold it in. i got to give it to the Lord. Number 164, we'll stand and sing to him. <laughs>
Let's remain standing for the reciting of the Peace Church Statement of Faith found in the back of the songbook on the left side and also on the screen. We believe that the Bible, consisting of the Old and New Testament, is the only inspired, true, authoritative, written Word of God. We believe that there is one God, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his atoning death, his bodily resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God the Father, and ultimately his personal return in power and glory. We believe in the present ministry of the Holy Spirit, whose indwelling power and fullness enables the Christian to live a godly life in this sinful world. We believe that water baptism and the Lord's Supper are sacraments to be observed by the church during this present age. However, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and his abundant grace provide the only basis for the justification and salvation of all who believe. We believe in the sanctity of human life at every stage. We believe in the spiritual unity of all believers in Jesus Christ. We believe in the bodily resurrection of the dead, of the believer to everlasting joy and blessedness with the Lord, of the unbeliever to everlasting conscious punishment. And thank you. You may be seated. And the kids can come up. And we're going to have the children's message. Are there any kids here today? One or two. Good morning. Look what I got with me today. I had this up in the pulpit last week, and I've been meaning to take it out. You know what it is? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, please forgive me. Talk, talk about your big blunders. You shake your hand. You get two ring pops today. <laughs> oh, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> you know what this is, though, right? It's a, it is a episode of the ring pop. This is a car, and it races, and it can go up to, well, real race cars can go up to 200 miles an hour. And sometimes in our lives, we like to go really fast. And we don't stop and take a break and say, God, please help me. I need your strength for the day because we're too busy racing around like little cars. And so what I want to tell you today is take time to talk to Jesus every day. And I'm, I'm going to talk to Jesus later and say, sorry, I accidentally let go of the car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's say a prayer. <coughs> Thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. Thank you, God, that we can stop racing around and take a break and pray to you. Any time during the day, you're available. We don't have to wait in line. You're there for us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. I should have put chalk on my hands first. Our, our scripture reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You don't hear a lot of sermons on 2 Corinthians. Most ministers run the other way when you mention it because it is, you know, it's got a lot of difficult subjects in it. But I really like it. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 through 11. Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. 
On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. This is the word of the Lord, and may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of Scripture. And Father, thank you for this chance to get into the word. We're dealing with a very important subject, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be faithful to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God never gives you more than you can handle. It's meant to be a word of encouragement. Somebody you love is going through a difficult time. You put your hand on their shoulder and say, it's going to be all right. Jesus loves you. He never gives you more than you can handle. But sometimes in life, it seems like things are more than we can handle. Maybe you're at the doctor's office for a follow-up appointment after a mammogram. He says, I think you need to sit down. You have cancer. It's already metastasized into the lymph nodes, and we need to start aggressive treatment right away. You cry. You dissolve in tears. You say, I can't believe it. This can't be happening. I'm young. I'm a mom. I've got kids. I've got a family. I have a job. I'm scared. The situation is more than you can handle. Or maybe you come home after a nice day in Appleton. The phone is ringing off the hook. You answer it. It's your son-in-law. He's crying. Your beautiful little girl has been in a terrible car accident. They life-lighted her to Theta Clark, but they don't know if she's going to make it. You collapse on the floor, faint with apprehension and fear. It's more than you can handle. And what about... Holocaust survivors. Who would have the guts to walk up to one of them and say, well, I guess God didn't give you more than what you could handle. It comes across as insensitive and uncaring and untrue. So we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and talk about what to do when life is more than you can handle. 2 Corinthians was written by Paul in the year 56 A.D., the book is all about Christian ministry in a world of hardships. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 7, Paul says, praise God we're going through what we're going through because he's using it in our lives to make us better ministers. The suffering and the comfort that we experience, we're able to share and identify and encourage others that are going through what we went through. And then in verse 8, Paul says, we don't want you to be unaware, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. The book of Acts mentions some of these hardships. Paul preaches the gospel and is pelted with rocks until he nearly dies in Acts 14. He's beaten to an inch of his life and thrown in jail in Acts 16. He's chased out of town in Acts 17. He's arrested in Acts 22. He nearly dies in a shipwreck in Acts 27, and he's still under house arrest as the book of Acts ends in Acts 28. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That would be enough for anybody. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul goes on. He says, five times I received the Jews, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from Gentiles, in danger from my own countrymen, and in danger from false brothers. And on top of that, every single day, I have my concern for all the churches. So what does Paul say about that? Thank you, God. I praise you, Jesus. You didn't give me more than I can handle. Woohoo! Not at all. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. He's saying God gave us more than we could handle. We were so strained and stressed and distressed that we thought we were going to die. We didn't know what was going to happen. 
well, why? Why would God put him in that situation? Look at verse 9. This happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God gives you more than you can handle so that you'll stop handling it and start letting him handle it. He wants you to realize that there are certain things in life you can't handle on your own. It's not in your best interests to handle these things on your own. How do I know that? John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. In the movie Million Dollar Baby, Maggie is knocking out all these easy fighters. But one day she steps in the ring with a very tough opponent, and she goes back to her corner at the end of the first round and says, wow, that girl is tough. I can't figure her out. Trainer says, I know. I knew this going in. She's more experienced than you are and more skilled than you are. And Maggie looks at her trainer for a second with fear. And then she says to him, what's the game plan, boss? And he figures out a game plan, and she goes out, and she wins the match. The trainer deliberately stepped up her comp competition and put her in a situation she couldn't handle without counsel. A situation that would encourage her to rely on the trainer's counsel all the way to the championship. God's doing that for us. He's our trainer. Sometimes he puts us in situations where it is in our best interest to stop relying on ourselves and rely on him. And when we do that, he's going to get us all the way to the championship in heaven. Amen? Thirteen years ago, I was hospitalized with a severe case of ulcerative colitis. And we tried all these different medicines and couldn't get the thing under control. Doctor says, i got to be honest, there's no cure for this apart from having your colon removed, and I'm not sure it's ever going to get any better. How many of you think it's time to look for a new doctor, amen? <laughs> it's very discouraging. But that really forced me to really throw myself into God. I, I really looked to him during that time. I said, Lord, this is more than I can handle, and apparently it's more than what the doctor can handle because he doesn't know what's going to happen. What's the game plan, boss? I need to know what you need, want me to do with this. I need you to get me through this bout of sickness. That time in the hospital was one of the more intimate times I had with the Lord in my relationship with him. Psalm 119, verse 71, David says, It was good for me to be afflicted, that I might learn your decrees. So having said that, where does this crazy idea come from that God never gives you more than you can handle? I suspect that it comes from a confused understanding of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Anyone know what that verse says? No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape. Now, it doesn't say that God will never give you more than you can handle. It says he won't give you more temptation than you can handle. He's always going to provide a way for you to escape temptation. Just like he did Joseph in Genesis chapter 39, running away from Potiphar's wife. But it doesn't say anywhere in the word of God that he'll always provide an escape from hardship. Quite the opposite. Paul says in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And Paul says in Acts 20, verse 23, I know that the Holy Spirit warns me wherever I go that there will be hardships. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus gave me, the task to testifying to the gospel of God's grace. This is a fallen world we're living in, and sometimes in a fallen world, things fall on people. Hard times happen this side of eternity. And when we try to handle all of the hard things by ourselves, we either mess up royally, amen, or 
We succeed, but we wear ourselves out with stress in the process. That, this is where I think kids are smarter than grown-ups. How many kids want to say amen to that? <laughs> well, when a kid is stressed or scared or hurt, what's the first thing he usually does? He runs to his mommy or his daddy. Daddy, help me, I'm scared, I hurt myself. He knows instinctively that either he can handle this by himself or he doesn't want to handle it by himself. He needs to go to somebody infinitely more powerful and capable than him. And what I'm saying today is we need to get in touch with our inner child. We need, when we're going through a hard time, to stop what we're doing and then go and run to our daddy. We need to tell him about it. We need to pray to him about it. We need to give it to someone infinitely more capable than ourselves. How do I know that? Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Another thing we need to remember is that we're not here on this earth simply for life, liberty, and the purchase of happiness. We're here to worship Jesus and witness for Jesus and get as many of our loved ones over to Jesus as we possibly can, to go to heaven and take as many people with us as we are able to. And God never said that it was going to be easy, did he? How many of you have seen those signs on the Calumet County country roads warning you about bumps and dips up ahead. It's been quite a few of them. We've had a very harsh winter. And even though I ride in a Toyota Avalon, I can feel the bumps just as much as anybody else. And sometimes if you hit a really big dip with a pothole in it, you pop up out of your seat like a cork. Boing, boing. It's very, it jars you. It's very uncomfortable. If you got back problems, you'll remember that you have back problems by the time you get home. It hurts. Some of you have gone over some bumps and dips in your life this year. The unexpected loss of a job. The passing of a loved one. The breakup of a relationship. Those have jarred you. Those are bumps and dips in, in the road of your life. And the way you respond to these things hinges on whether you're living a self-centered life or a Jesus-centered life. If the main thing in life, if all you care about is peace, prosperity, and personal happiness, you're going to have a hard time handling hardship. When times are tough, you're going to have a hard time resisting being mad at God because you're going to feel like he owes you, that you deserve a life of peace and prosperity life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if even the slightest thing goes wrong to deviate you from that goal in your life, you're going to feel like it's an affront. You're offended. You're disappointed with the Lord. But if your main goal in life is to worship Jesus and witness for Jesus and serve Jesus, then you're going to see hardships as merely potholes in the road, just little dips that you got to get past. You're going to know that when times are tough, God is good. You're going to remember that all things work together for the good of those who love God. You're going to remember that this life is not all there is, and that at the end of the eternal day, we are going to be with the Lord in celebration with Him forever. You're going to remember that in Him, we win. And that Jesus is Lord. And that every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that he is Lord of the glory of God the Father. And if you truly love Jesus more than anybody else, then you need to let him train you and grow you and develop you. And you need to let him use every situation and circumstance in your life, even the hard things, even the difficult things, to make you and mold you into the image of his son. That's why we're here. Life wasn't easy for Jesus either, was it? He could have said, Lord, I'm disappointed in you. Why did you drive me into the desert to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights? Why did you let me experience so much rejection? 
Why couldn't I have gotten married and have children and built up a retirement savings account and live to the age of 85 and then die on the cross for the sins of the world? I mean, what's the rush? What's the big deal here? But Jesus realized, I'm not here simply for my own purposes. I'm here because I have a ministry. I'm here because I have a mission. I'm here to be the perfect Lamb of God who gives his life on the cross for the sins of the world in the prime of his life. And then I'm going to rise again. And I'm going to look to the Father and pray to the Father and trust the Father every step of the way. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23 says, He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And God wants you to die to yourself and live for him just like Jesus did. David Garland in his commentary on 2 Corinthians says that our lives in this world are meant to be after the image of Jesus' life in this world. Just as he went through many hardships on the way to the cross and redemption, we're going to go through many hardships on the way to the kingdom of God. It's par for the course. And we are to pray to him and trust him each step. I was reading online about a first grade girl named Elsa. She saw that there was a, a boy named Lee who always played by himself at recess and the kids picked on him because he had learning disabilities. And Elsa thought, well I wouldn't want anybody picking on me for anything, so I'm going to be nice to the boy. And so she plays with him during recess, and they actually become best friends. They go on the swings together, they play on the monkey bars together, and pretty soon the kids stopped making fun of Lee and started making fun of Elsa. Elsa and Lee sitting in the tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, just teasing her mercilessly. And so then she stopped being Lee's friend so people would stop picking on her. But then after a while she felt guilty about that. You know, he's my friend, he needs me. And so she started hanging out with them again, and they started teasing her even more till one day she cried. The teacher found out about it and addressed the entire class. And then Lee got up and spoke. He said, last year everybody made fun of me, and I went home crying every single night. So I prayed this year that Jesus would send me a friend to help me, and he sent me the best friend I ever had, Elsa. And she smiled. The situation was more than he could handle. So he gave it to Jesus, and Jesus handled it. He sent the girl into his life, and after he shared that story, the kids didn't pick on him ever again. Praise the Lord. How many of you are in situations right now that are more than you can handle? How many of you are ready to call for backup? How many of you need the strong support of God and his angels to protect you and watch over you? All you have to do is ask him. He'll give you the grace and strength to get through what you need to get through in order to get to what you need to get to. If he brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. He will complete his work of redemption in your life. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 10, He has delivered us from this deadly peril, and He will continue to deliver us. In other words, praise God for all the times He helped me in the past, and now I have confidence and will rely on Him that He's going to deliver me again in the future. There's a story that I love to tell at weddings. Pastor Bruce Larson was minister in New York City for many years. And when he witnessed the people, he often took them to Fifth Avenue. And the first place he took them was the RCA building. And there's a statue of the most muscular man in the wor world, Atlas, straining to hold the world in his hands. And you can literally see the angst and the anguish etched in his face as he tried to hold the world up. And Pastor Larson says, that's one way to live your life. Now let me show you another way. And he took him across the street to St. Patrick's Cathedral. And in the back of the church, and Jeannie and I were there, there's a statue of a nine-year-old Jesus effortlessly holding the world in his hands. And Pastor Larson says, which way do you want to go? 
Do you want to strain under the weight of the world trying to take care of all your problems by yourself? Or are you ready to say, Jesus, I want you to handle it. I want you to hold it. You can hold my marriage together. You can hold my life together. You can give me the strength and the grace for me to get through what I need to get through. That is the way to go. Because sometimes life is more than we can handle. And that's why it's time for us to let Jesus handle it. I invite you to give everything to the Lord. He loves you. He cares for you. He took the weight of the cross on his shoulders so that the weight of the world could come off your shoulders. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We thank you for Paul's candid confession that sometimes life is more than we can handle. Sometimes we are under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despair even of life. Father, be with each and every one who's going through a tough time right now. I pray that they would hand it over to you every single day until they experience long-term permanent relief. I pray that they would reach out to their Christian brothers and sisters for encouragement and strength. I pray, Lord, that you would give them ministry to others in their lives while they wait for their deliverance. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll remain seated and sing number four, Majesty. Worship His Majesty. If you have any special prayer requests um, to lift up today, yes, Lynn. Okay, we need to pray for Lynn's dad for healing after surgery and for improved health. June. June Ballou's nephew, Noah Kleppen, diagnosed with cancer, needs our prayers. Okay. Yes, Paul. Okay. Pray for those looking for employment. Yes, Jeannie. Pastor Saeed in Iran. Pastor Saeed in Iran. For his freedom. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are, it's a joy to have fellowship with you. 
sometimes with all of the things that happen in our lives, we, you know, we lose track of the fact that this is the central, most important thing we can do, is to make contact with you. We never stop believing in you, but sometimes we get a little lost on the way. Thank you for bringing us back here today. Lord, we want to pray for some of the people that have been brought to our attention, to our hearts and minds. We pray for Lynn Stecker's dad for um, a surgery that he's having and for healing from that surgery, but also his complete recovery hinges in part on him taking care of himself. So, Father, we pray for that, that he would not only take care of himself physically, but that he would take care of himself spiritually by reaching out to Jesus, by saying, Lord, this is more than I can handle. I need you to give me the grace and the strength. Lord, we pray for Noah Kleppen, diagnosed with cancer at such a young age. We pray, God, that he finds strength and support in you, that you would make contact with him and that he would respond and receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And we pray, Lord, for his healing, that for a complete deliverance from this cancer and that he would know that you were his great physician. And God, we pray for those who are looking for employment and, and it says in the, in the Bible that you will instruct us in the way chosen for us. You will guide us in the way that we should go. And it says in Psalm 37, 24, and 25 that you have never seen the righteous forsaken. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to provide for the needs of those who are looking for jobs, that you would set before them doors of opportunity to serve you and represent you and guide them. Lord, we pray for Pastor Saeed in Iran. We pray for his freedom. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for his faithful stand for Christ. But like when people prayed for Peter and Paul to be released from jail, we pray for Pastor Saeed to be released from jail. We pray also, Lord, for all the unspoken requests in a congregation our size. There's bound to be some out there. Be close to those who are brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And be with our president, our Congress, and our courts. Be with our governor and our state elected officials. Help them to make wise choices. And if there are some out there that aren't, I pray, Lord, that you would replace them with ones who will. We pray for our troops. We thank you for the young men and women who are giving their lives for the cause of freedom around the world. I pray that you would watch over them, and at the same time, they would conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus himself, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to have our closing song of worship, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. After the closing benediction, we'll take a five-minute recess. You can get something to drink, and stretch your legs and your arms, and then come back in because we will have the quarterly meeting of the congregation. Our closing song, I think it's number 358, right? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. <laughs>